Welcome back everyone for today's video we are going to be taking a look at a couple of games from the ninth round of the Tata Steel Chess Tournament which is being held in the city of Vikonze and in the great country of the Netherlands. Now this tournament has been very choppy there's some very top players some players a little bit lower rated we've had some imbalances and for that reason there have been many decisive games. Now yesterday was a rest day in the tournament but with that rest day a lot of the players are looking to come out fighting. So there are a couple of games that we want to highlight and the first one we'll be taking a look at is game played between the Chinese player Wei Yi and of course the challenger for the World Chess Championship Jan Nepomuchi. Now Wei Yi is a player who started off very strong in chess. He was a junior who's really really well known fastest player in history I believe to reach the rating of 2700. He got to about 2740 before he really stagnated. Now of course with the pandemic and everybody being stuck at home and more specifically with for the Chinese players who were unable to travel, chess became very difficult. And Wei Yi really has not been someone who's been active in recent times, but nonetheless, it is great to see him back in action. So without further ado, let's jump right into the, the action. So Wei Yi playing with the white pieces, Yan with the black pieces, and now the game starts with the move E4. Yan plays the move E5, and Wei Yi plays this move Bishop C4. Now, the Bishop's opening is something that's played a little bit at the top level. It's not super frequent, but one of the reasons that players sometimes play this opening is that when you're playing a player like Yan Nepomuchi, who always plays the classic Petrov with Knight F6 on move 2, it's very hard to get an ori original position early on in the game. And if you don't go Bishop C4, you play Knight F3, Knight F6, already you either have to take or play play knight c3 or potentially d4 and the paths tend to become very limited so when Wei Yi plays bishop c4 and we get knight f6 and d3 here Wei Yi is hoping to maybe play knight c3 maybe go f4 maybe go knight f3 but a lot of flexibility in the position and you're not going down one specific path at the very start of the game so Nepo goes c6 and now we get the move knight f3 we get d5 here trying to attack the bishop on c4 we have the move bishop b3 and Nepo goes bishop b4 check here, Wei Yi plays the move bishop d2, offering the trade of the bishops. You could play knight d2 potentially here, but after d takes e4, d takes e4, and something like queen e7, black should be completely fine. So we get bishop d2. Bishop takes bishop is played. Wei Yi takes with the knight here. Now, in some of the recent title Tuesdays, I have actually played this move queen takes d2. And if black is not very careful here and he plays a natural looking move like pawn takes pawn, after knight takes pawn and castles, white can play a temporary sacrifice with knight takes f7 rook f7 d takes e4 after queen e7 takes takes an f3 white is a little bit better here due to this the four pawns in the center versus these two pawns on the king side and i actually won a very nice game in this exact line against the famous freaking legend god Kamsky in the last title tuesday Nonetheless, Wei Yi decides to capture with the knight, guarding the pawn on e4, and still keeping pressure on the pawn on e5. Here, Nepo plays move a5, and now we get this move a4. If white were to grab what looks like a free pawn on e5, it would be uh-oh spaghetti-o time, because after a4, the bishop on b3 is simply trapped. If you take the pawn, you lose the bishop. Where else can you move it? You go to c4, I take your bishop. You take on d5, I take your bishop. So you're going to lose the bishop for a couple of pawns here, and in the top level of in top level chess games you're almost certainly going to lose the game as well so way he goes a4 stopping this a4 pawn push now we get knight bd7 guarding the pawn on e5 way he castles nepo castles and now we get the move rookie one over protecting the pawn on e4 but also potentially intending to say trade the pawns on d5 and then win this pawn on e5 and be up a pawn so Nepo goes rook to e8 here, and now we have pawn takes pawn anyway. Nepo captures back, and now black has this nice looking center with the knights on f6 and d7 guarding these central pawns, and it feels like black might be a little bit better potentially, but you still can't easily push the pawns or move the knight. They are not very mobile. Let's say white were to play h3, for example. If you go knight c5, you lose the pawn on e5. If you go e4 after takes, takes, and knight g5, suddenly the pawns on e4 and f7 are very, very weak. So even though black has what looks like a nice center here, it's not super concrete in terms of how to push the pawns or finish your development because you have the bishop and the rook, which are not in the game yet. So Wei Yi plays this move knight to b1 here, and this is a very deep conceptual move. Wei Yi wants to go knight c3. He wants to put pressure on the pawn on d5 while maintaining the current pressure on the pawn on e5. So now we get b6 from Nepo, knight c3, bishop to b7, fianchettoing the bishop here and guarding the pawn on d5, and maybe intending to put the rook on c8. Here, Wei Yi goes knight b5, and now we see one of the big drawbacks, Nepo having played a5 super early, going for the classic cheese strats, trying to trap the bishop on b3, because now after knight b5, white has this great outpost for the knight, you can't easily kick the knight away, and their idea is like knight d6 down the road. 
So we have queen b8 played by Nepo to stop either knight d6 or knight to c7 here. And now we have d4 being played, e4 and knight d2. Now what Wei Yi is trying to argue here is that white center is actually a little bit better than blacks for a couple of reasons. First of all, you can always go c4 to chip away at the central pawn on d5. You can also play f3 to chip away at the pawn on e4. And white center actually can't be attacked. If you play a move like h6 and white gets c3, for example, white has this nice chain and you still have c4, you still have f3. And white's position is actually considerably better, especially with this knight on b5, which can always jump to d6 or c7 down the road. So here Nepo goes bishop c6, and now Wei Yi plays the move c4, trying to strike immediately at this black pawn chain in the center. Here Nepo decides to take the knight on b5, and now Wei Yi captures with the a pawn, which of course is the correct move. You could maybe consider capturing with the c pawn, but after knight to f8 and knight e6, your pawn on d4 is going to become weak very, very quickly. And generally speaking here, you want to go after both these pawns on d5 and e4 and weak in the center. So we get a takes b5 nepo plays queen f4 and now we have g3 being played computer is giving white already a small advantage nepo plays queen f5 we get c takes d5 and here the move rook a d8 is played this is the first step going the wrong direction here computer wants h5 here potentially i think even knight d5 would have made some sense possibly or actually no it doesn't because it loses after g4 as the computer points out so if you go queen g5 there's h4 and now the queen cannot guard this knight on d5 and if you go queen e6 for example after knight takes e4 their idea is like knight c5 knight c3 knight g5 knight g3 etc and white has a big advantage so Nepo plays rook d8 instead and now we get f3 from way another move that i really like even if it's not the best computer move computer wants queen c2 it's forcing black to figure out what he's doing in a hurry and the reason is that white is only temporarily up the pawn with these double pawns on d5 but if you can ever go d6 or even if you can for example trade all these pieces off this double pawn in the center is actually going to become a serious strength especially with ideas like knight e5 and knight c6 looming down the road so nebo does trade he goes queen g5 does not trade the queens on f3 way he goes knight c4 here trying to go for either knight d6 or knight e5 and spying the pawns on b6 and a5 as well now here Nepo plays the move h5 which according to the computers at least effectively loses the game but it's really hard to understand the computer's favorite move which is this very strange move king f8 and I, I think the reason is quite simple if you were to play a move like rook b8 white can maybe go d6 anyway because at some point you're gonna have this nasty idea with rook e7 moving the knight away and putting a lot of threats here towards this pawn on f7 as well as this king on g8 so my understanding of the position is the computer wants king f8 because if white goes d6 and you take now rook e7 is not an idea because black can simply gobble up the pawn on e7 so nepo goes h5 instead we get to move d6 nepo plays king f8 now trying to stop rook e7 but unfortunately here it's one move too late if nepo were to have played queen b5 and rook e7 here white is very close to winning here a sample line would be something like king f8 for example white can sack the rook and after king takes rook there's now knight to e5 with double check king f8 knight g6 and this is simply checkmate another variation here would be something like a4 for example where white can now just simply go rook takes a4 he's up a pawn if you play rook f8 actually which is the other move that makes some sense to guard the pawn now there's knight to e5 and white has massive massive pressure here in the center of the board you've got the kebab on the seventh here you get the diagonal and pressure on f7 and h5 and it's just totally hopeless so that's why nepo does go king f8 we get rook e7 anyway takes takes king takes pawn and you're thinking well the line you just showed black is okay but here black is not okay and the reason that black is not okay is because now way he plays rook to e1 check king f8 and this crushing move knight to d6 now the computer actually wanted um queen e2 with knight d6 it prefers this a little bit more just because black doesn't have any entries on the d2 square since the queen covers it but nonetheless it's still great for way Yi. So we get the position here queen d2 is played and now the move queen c3 is played by way e not the best move computer wants king f1 but again beggars can't be choosers and queen c3 still does maintain a big advantage so nepo trades the queens on c3 and temporarily it's like queens are off the board looks okay but it's not actually okay and the reason is that this f7 pawn is still a severe weakness and the knight is going to be jumping all over the place creating mating threats so nepo goes g6 here one sample line just to show you guys something like knight b8 knight f7 and rook c8 but after knight to e5 there's this big threat where after rook c3 knight g6 is simply checkmate here king has no squares available 
And if you play something like king e8, for example, white can go knight c6, king f8. And now there are many ways for white to win. Knight e7 would be the cleanest, but even d5 here with ideas like d6 and this great bastion on c6 give white great opportunities to win the game. So Nepo goes g6. Now we get the move h3 being played here by Wei Yi. Nepo goes a4 here, a desperation move to try and distract the bishop from going after the pawn on f7. Here, Wei Yi goes bishop to a2, which is another move I really, really like, because what Wei Yi understands here is that this a pawn, if it's going up the board, it looks really nice, but the bishop stops the pawn. This pawn can never move forward because the bishop is in the way, and white always intends to capture the pawn on f7. So after bishop a2, a3, Wei Yi plays king g2 here. This is another nice finesse move. He could just take on f7, but he decides to wait with king g2 because his pawn is never going anywhere. Here, Nepo plays the move rook to a8, trying desperately to go rook a5, rook a4, something to create counterplay. Wei Yi plays king to f3 here, another nice move. We get rook to a5, and now king to f4 is played. Now, what Wei Yi understands is that Nepo really can't do anything here. His knight is really, really stuck on d7 as well as f6. No jumps for the knight on d7, can't go to d5. So both these knights are simply stuck, and white is just going for a classic king march, and at some point will capture the pawn on f7. Nepo plays rook a8, just making moves out of inertia. We get king to g5. Now we have rook d8. And finally, Wei Yi decides to capture this pawn on f7 because with the king all the way up on g5, now if black tries to move a knight, for example, you can simply take the knight on f6. And if you try to move the knight, now the king is an attacking piece in this endgame. And this is very, very reminiscent of a game played between, it's a little bit different, between Nigel Short and Jan Timon many years ago, where Nigel Short was able to bring a king all the way up the board and create a checkmate. While it's not a checkmate in this position, the king is a great attacking piece here. And Nepo just can't do anything. His pieces are totally paralyzed. So Nepo does, in fact, play knight b8 here. We get king takes knight, rook takes knight, and now this move bishop e6 is played. Here, Nepo goes knight to d7. We get king takes pawn, and now he plays this very tricky move, knight to e5, hoping that Wei Yi will capture with the rook, because now after a2, there's some serious counterplay. If white were to go rook e1 stopping the pawn, black can sack the rook, creating the check. You move the king, you lose the rook in the game, you capture the rook, black gets a queen, and will win the game himself. So ne so Nepo's trying to create some counterplay, but here Wei Yi correctly plays the move king to f6, and now Nepo simply resigns the game. And the reason that Nepo resigns, it might seem a little bit abrupt, is that wherever he moves the knight, let's say you go to f3, there's rook to a1, you simply lose the pawn, knight d3, same thing, rook a1, all these squares are covered. If you try h4, for example, white can take the pawn and go for the checkmate with rook to a8 next turn. And if you go for the other move, which is knight d7, now white plays king f5, Knight still has no squares available. The pawn on d4 covers. The king covers f6. White can always go rook to a1 and win the pawn. And after knight b8, rook a1, for example, you lose the pawn. Knight again is dominated. No squares available here. And white is simply winning. So after king to f6, Jan Nepomuchi resigns this game against Wei Yi from China. A masterful game from Wei Yi from start to finish, showing great understanding. I really would say maybe there were one or two moves where Nepo had a chance, but once he missed some opportunities and White got these strong double pawns in the center, Wei Yi played a perfect game, gave Nepo zero chance to save it, and a very, very tough loss for Nepo. But on the flip side, as I've said many times, when you lose the game in chess, if your opponent plays a perfect game, it's much easier to deal with that because you just put your hands up in the air and you're like, okay, you played a perfect game, what to do? And this was a case of Wei Yi showing how strong he can be. And one of the reasons that for many years, Wei Yi was considered to potentially be a challenger to Magnus Carlsen. And while he's not super old, Wei Yi now is in his mid 20s, maybe not mid, but early 20s. And time is slipping away. But if he keeps playing like this, you never know what the future can hold for him. So a great win. Wei Yi moves up the standings. Nepo loses his shot at potentially winning the tournament with this game. But that is life. So the second game that we're going to be taking a look at is a game played between one of the current leaders, I believe, or maybe it's a half point out, Noderbeck Abdusatorov and the talented Dutch player Jorn Van Forst. Now, both players don't need an introduction, but Jorn Van Forst is a very strong Dutch player. He's been over 2,700 on multiple occasions, but he seems to be very up and down, a very volatile player. Sometimes he plays great chess. Sometimes he plays some serious stinkers. Noderbeck is another player we've been talking about a lot over the last couple of years. One of the top juniors in the world. I would say second really only only to Ali Reza Faruja from Iran. So Noderbeck has, has shown great talent over the years. He also had a very strong result last year and Tata still came very close to winning it until the final round, which I believe he actually lost to Jordan Van Forest, if I'm not mistaken. And this year is no different where he is doing very well 
um, also. So without further ado, into the game we go. So the game starts with a move e4 from Noterbeck. We get this move e5 from Jordan, knight f3, knight c6, and bishop c4, knight f6, d3. And here Jordan plays this move d5, trying to go for a slightly more novel approach in the classic Gucci piano. Now, there are many moves that are playable. Bishop c5, bishop e7, d6. I think even g... Well, g6 here maybe is not playable, but bishop c5, bishop e7, d6, d5. Even h6, I think, has been played in this position. So black has a lot of options. Now, when Jordan plays d5, this is one of the newer approaches, where black tries to strike in the center immediately and create some simplifications and easier play. So Noterbeck trades on d5. We get castles, and now we have the move bishop to e7, potentially intending to castle to the king side. Here, Noterbeck goes rook e1, pressuring the pawn on e5. In this position, we get the move f6 from Jordan, and now Noterbeck plays bishop b3. Now, the idea behind bishop b3 is simply you don't ever want this bishop to be hanging on c4. Additionally, you can also play for d4. So one sample line is d4, and I think this was actually played in a game earlier in the tournament between Hans Moke Niemann and Mark andre Maritzi from France. And I think after knight b6, bishop b5, and castles, takes, takes, d e5, takes takes i think it was was it fe5 or bishop f5 or i forget the move that mark andre andrea maritzi played but he did win a very nice game against hans a hand hans a second loss in a row and this position is very simplified maybe it was actually bishop g4 now that i think about it but a lot of stuff comes off the board immediately so Noterbeck plays bishop b3 to dodge the threats with knight b6 he keeps d4 alive c4 and or knight c3 and there's a lot of flexibility in the white position here we got the move a5 from Jordan, trying to go for the classic Jan Nepomuchi to cheese the bishop on b3 by pushing the pawn on the edge. Here, Noterbeck plays c3. It stops a4, because of a4, you simply take the pawn and the bishop and the queen guard each other. It also supports the thrust with d4 on the next turn to go after this black center and put massive pressure towards this king on e8 and on the diagonal towards the knight on d5. Here we get knight b6 from Jordan, and now knight h4 played here by Noterbeck. Knight h4, a very aggressive move. If black were to play a move like a4, now you have this crushing move, queen to h5, checking the king, since black has pushed upon early. And after g6, you can sack the knight, and after takes, takes, king d7, swap the queens, go bishop c2. White has a rook for a knight here, and white is completely winning. So Jordan goes g6 to stop the move queen to h5. Now we get the move a4, stopping black from playing a4. And already here, as you guys can tell from the evaluation bar, Noterbeck is already clearly better by more than one and a half points. So something has gone wrong for Jordan in this opening phase. I don't know if it was like, if it was this position where the computer says queen d7 is best, whether he didn't know it after knight h4. But either way, we're only 11 moves into the game and already Jordan is lost according to the computer. So we get bishop d6, and now Noterbeck plays d4, trying to strike at the center. Black's big issue here is that castling kingside is no longer possible. This bishop always stops black from castling. And so the only real idea you have here is to try to develop and somehow try to get the king to the queen side because this bishop is never going anywhere. It's always glued to the b3 square. Now on top of that, white is also opening up the center of the board, and it's just really, really dire straits here for Jordan. So Jordan plays queen e7. We get bishop to e3, played not the best move, by the way, but it's still a move that I like quite a bit. Now we have bishop d7 being played by Jordan Van Forst, trying desperately to castle the king out of the center of the board. Here, Noterbeck takes on e5. We get pawn takes pawn. Black cannot capture with the knight or the bishop after bishop takes f4, attacking the bishop. Once you move the bishop, I trade this bishop for the knight, and there are all kinds of problems on the e-file. If you play knight e5, it's not much different. There still is f4, and after knight c4, again, I just trade the knight for the bishop, win the queen on e7, finish my development, and win the game with a queen for a rook. So f takes e5 is played here by Jordan Van Forest. Now we get knight to f3, which temporarily does stop black from castling. If you castle, there's bishop g5 here, simply winning material, uh, either the queen or the rook in this position. So we have h6 to stop the bishop g5 idea here. Now knight bd2 played by Noterbeck. Jordan decides castle. Noterbeck plays knight e4, pressuring both this bishop on d6 as well as the knight on b6. Jordan plays bishop f5. We get knight fd2, guarding the knight on e4. But more importantly, white has this great bastion of the knight on e4. Cannot be removed because black cannot put a pawn on either this d5 square or this f5 square. No pawns to push in the center of the board. So this bastion ensures that white has a very serious advantage. So Jordan Van Forest plays knight d7 here. 
Noterbeck plays the move bishop d5, putting pressure on the knight on c6. Computer actually says here after queen g7, queen e2, and king b8, white is not winning on the spot necessarily, but it's very, very hard for black to play. After knight d7, bishop d5, however, black is clearly lost. And the reason is that black has all these weaknesses on the queen side, and he really has no play on the king side. Either there's no attack coming towards the white king, and white can go knight c4, b4, etc., and it's just very bad. So we get knight c5. Here, Noterbeck decides to play queen e2 with the idea of maybe going queen b5 and trying to put a lot of pressure towards the knight on c6 here and the pawns on b7 as well as a5. Jordan Van Forest plays knight b8, and now we get this move rook a d1. Another nice move from Noterbeck, putting these rooks in the center of the board and preparing to maybe trade the knight for the bishop, maybe trade on c5, maybe even go b4. But black has all these very, very passive pieces, and the position is totally hopeless. So Van Forest goes knight a6, Noterbeck trades for the bishop, now we get pawn takes, probably queen takes was better, but after knight c4, forking the queen on the pawn, let's just say black goes queen e7, knight a5, this is also totally hopeless. So we get pawn takes, and now Noterbeck plays knight c4, pressuring the pawns in the center, as well as the pawn on a5. Here, Jordan Van Forest plays queen c7, and after this move, queen to d2, Jordan Van Forest resigned this game on move number 24. And you're probably thinking, wait, how do you resign here? It's even material, what's going on? And the reason that Van Forest resigned is pretty straightforward. If black were to play a move like king to b8 here, white can go b4, the queen and the pawns guard each other and attack the knight. Let's say black trades and goes knight e4. There's always an idea with some bishop b6. Potential. I guess actually in this position it's no good. But let's say queen b2, knight f6, and bishop b6 is simply winning the game here for white. If black tries to take and go knight a4, now after rook to a1, let's say b5, for example, there's rook c1. Black king is wide open here. Their idea is like queen e7 and knight a5 with a family fork. Maybe you sack the rook, and it's just totally hopeless here. This attack is, is breaking through on the queen side, and Van Forest can't do anything. Another idea here is knight b3 to kick the queen and stop white from pushing the pawn. But after queen e2 and knight c5, white probably here can play b4 right away or even rook to a1. I actually do think that Van Forest should have played knight to b3 here to try and force uh force Noterbeck to find a better idea there's even knight a3 knight b5 rook a1 g4 there are so many different moves that are winning here for white that it's hard to pick one but still knight b3 I think should have been played because queen e2 is the best move but I think that at this point Jorn Van Forest who's already not having a good good tournament just sort of threw in the towel because he hated the position he didn't really see any counterplay white has the two bishops the raging attack on the queen side and he simply didn't want to suffer and he figured it's better to resign and save an hour of my life than play on and lose anyway so Noterbeck gets a very, very big win here in the ninth round. He now moves into a tie for first place alongside the two Indian juniors, Gukesh and Pragnananta, as well as Anish Giri. He's looking very strong. We'll see if he can bring it home this year. He was so, so close last year, but he does get some revenge by beating Jordan Van Forest, who did ruin his dream last year. So a very, very nice win for Noterbeck, and it's really exciting to see his future progress and to see whether he can bring it home in this Tata Steel event. So on that note, I hope you guys have enjoyed this recap from round number nine of the Tata Steel Chess Tournament being held in the city of Vikonse and in the country of the Netherlands. If you have not already subscribed to the channel, make sure you smash that subscribe button below, and we'll be back soon with some more great recaps from the Tata Steel Chess Tournament. See you guys. Bye.